Hello everyone! Today we talk about Byzantines and Franks in the Seljuk army. This is the first video that we dedicate specifically to the Seljuk military by looking at this uh, kind of allogen elements. Um, and if you want a big, a bit of an introduction now, we will make it partly, but uh, there is uh, a video I think I made in Seljuk Turks in Islamic World and another three hours video actually in the Battle of Manzikert. So that could be useful also because we're we're gonna discuss actually a bit um you know the, the, a bit later times now um than than those so this is a kind of a continuation obviously just in a kind of a broader introductory part because we're gonna discuss the Seljuk uh, military especially the Seljuk of Rome right so the Anatolian um principality between the 11th and the 13th century, roughly. We will mention also the Ottomans at one point, especially for looking at the persistences of the military organization, um, you know, uh, in the in the Byzantine fashion, especially in, in the uh, Turkish lands, and the presence, obviously, of Christian militias in the Seljuk armies. Um, but today I would like mostly to focus on um, a uh, bas relief actually that we will introduce very broadly now that is discussed uh, as essentially a proof of um, you know certain say it's called them western influences on this on, on Seljuk equipment proper because this is actually the highly discussed topic that we know that even if we know actually we will make a list now of contingents of uh, especially of Frankish origin, but also of Armenian origin, and partly of Byzantine, um, you know, mm, let's say, broadly meant into the Seljuk armies, because that's the most discussed thing. But we don't have any direct evidence of an extremely heavy influence of um, in, in tactics and equipment from the Byzantine side, right? The, the Byzantine side is mostly... Uh, observed in in the permanence of this administrative structures that the Turks inherit while they uh, you know after they had they settle into the Anatolian plateau right so giving a bit of introduction can be interesting so we, what we're talking here about the room is simply the so-called land of the Romans right that was used in this <coughs> sort of uh, you know limited sense to refer to the ex-Byzantine regions of Anatolia that were conquered by the Seljuks uh, and their successors uh, actually also uh, during and after the 11th century, right? And the, um, the, the there was, as you know, a sort of going back and forth a little bit there were uh, in, in Byzantine history, especially by the mid-12th century, this uh, revival that brings to to the almost an, uh, the quasi annihilation actually of the of the sultanate of Iconium that was the the, 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 the greatest uh, power into the Muslim power in the Anatolian plateau there were actually lots of other princi Muslim principalities uh, in there um, <clears throat> so here strategically speaking what the, the objective of, of the Byzantines wasn't uh, was uh, now it's co kind of complicated to explain because Byzant the Byzantines remain even the the, uh, the the conquest of the um, of the interland of Anatolia um, on along the coasts right so the Byzantines actually there is this idea that after Manzikert and also after Miriakhevlan now that they were doomed they had simply to disappear because the Turks now had taken the Anatolian plateau and that that was pretty much it actually it's absolutely false there is no evidence that proves that uh, the Byzantine Empire was done because of that. Obviously, the, the, the massive blow uh, is the Fourth Crusade, and I have no ideological reason whatsoever now to say, ah, it was there for... No, I'm just telling, in terms of strategical balance, what changed. And actually, up to the, the 14th century included, uh, the Byzantines probably had um, a, uh, a chance to, to, to rip reconquer uh, large parts of Anatolia, uh, especially in the 14th century, they kind of concentrated into the Balkans, in Thrace, 
Um, that was not probably a great uh, strategical choice, whether if, if they had expanded to the east, perhaps, perhaps, they, they might have um, <clears throat> obtained uh, better better results, but now this this is a topic that... However, the, the main goal of the Byzantines was wiping out the, um, the Sultanate of Iconium to reconnect all the, even the same coastal centers of Anatolia, because the great problem for them was not really reacquiring the central Anatolia, because many historians have pointed out, but why did the Byzantines invest so many money in reconquering lands that after this, the, the Turkish conquest had kind of grown poorer after all? You know, if you study the, the history of the Anatolian frontier between, I don't know, the 12th century, 13th century, there are beautiful sources, uh, even if you study Nicetas Coniatus, or, or is, there is even... Uh, there are many that, that 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 show what that really was about it was fundamentally uh you know poor world uh, marked by a certain decadence even of cities etc so what was the goal of the Byzantines to recover these lands from the turks well the the main goal was really to reconnect paradoxically into the uh through the uh, in, in interlands roads those uh, coastal centers that were still in their hands, because the problem now is that these coastal centers, by not having much of a contact to, with the interland, in the sense that it was held hold by someone else, usually an enemy, not always, because actually many of these cities sometimes even cooperated with the Muslims. Um, and today's video is aimed at demolishing even the last, um, <coughs> you know, uh, I, I don't even know how to define regurgitations of this idea that, you know, the clash was between Christians and Muslims. That's just what kind of in fairy tales you can spot. Uh, those were times in which every political reason was good to go kill and slaughter each other, take the same Christians, become the Crusaders, the Byzantines, uh, the Crusaders even among each other. You know, that was a mix, actually, of everybody doing what the hell they wanted. And don't come tell me that was about religion, because it's just a, a massive pile of bullshit that every person who has at least opened a history book is able to understand if it doesn't have an IQ less than, I don't know, well, you know, the, the minimal standard to be recruited into, into the army, stuff like that. But the, the main point here is that the, the, the empire proper that, that is Constantinople in a nutshell, because let's be honest, the empire was Constantinople and only Constantinople. There is nothing like, you know... The rest of the empire was some somehow, uh, you know, uh, or even happy to be under that rule. Take cities like Thessalonica that always tried to sneak out from from Constantinople and Greece as much as they could. And and these coastal centers were were trying to do exactly the same. Um, that is to say, to become sort of maritime republics on their own. Right? They had interests in maritime trade, etc. And as long as the interland remain, uh, remained Turkish, the problem is that these guys would keep investing not into uh, the interland, but on, on, on the sea. So uh, the, uh, the, the pretty massive effort that the Byzantines put in reconquering this land of central Anatolia, that after the Turkish invasion had radically changed, I mean, in the local economy, it didn't make it seem to, so... Um, so favorable to reconquer these lands was to basically reconnect um, those cities, those coastal cities, even in the inter in the interland. So that is to say, okay, le let's invest into this other ter terrestrial routes, and therefore let's, um, in this sense, invest even in the, u in, the in the geographical unity of the empire. Incidentally, right? Uh, because uh, Central Anatolia had widely changed. I mean, um, up to the 11th century conquest uh, after the Battle of Manzikert, um, the Byzantines had held uh, a pretty consistent functional system in there. I mean, the as you know, especially he Byzantine heavy cavalry was heavily drawn from the uh, Anatolian uh, districts. Um, the empire had enough resources to invest in things like uh, even uh, dam for uh, for agriculture, irrigation, stuff like that. So it was a relatively fertile area, right? Turkish arrival brings to a sort of de desertification and, um, let's say, a relative decline because 
for many reasons actually the first one is that as we will see now the Turks were not a single entity here um, when you see this enormous mega maps of the Seljuk Empire well the Seljuk Empire was for real just basically Persia the, the, what are called the Great Seljuks and obviously they had an empire that could more or less extend elsewhere but de facto locally as in any single medieval context the thing was much more decentralized and as we'll see the invasion of Anatolia by Turks and not only because actually there were lots even of Kurds etc and other ethnicities that basically swept into into Anatolia once the Byzantine uh, defenses collapsed <coughs> Uh, by themselves, so th there was no unity, right? The Sultanate of Iconium was kind of the biggest thing that was formed. Uh, um, the uh, eventually there were even the, the, the Nanishmenids that had this f uh, fluctuating uh, fortunes, let's say, and eventually disappeared. And even before, essentially, the rise of the Ottomans, uh, this area was never quite really uh, reunified politically speaking so that's really an important factor in explaining the fact that not being there a central state like the empire had been uh, all these principalities had to rebuild their power on, on completely different bases um, so there were no major investments no structural investments from a, an overruling power that could maintain the same uh, base and power etc and even the same in fact land exploitation was um, transitioning towards something kind of more pastoral like than agricultural uh, even though as we said at the beginning the uh, because that's how the Turks were used to live the Turks come from the the, the heart of the steppes in Central Asia and they they, uh, they had the kind of lifestyle especially in this first phase where people came literally from those Central European uh, excuse me Central Asian lands um, uh, you know were settling like in the first time living like they had used to. Obviously they progressively sedentarized and therefore there is this even kind of strange hybrid between uh, what already existed in terms of Byzantine administration and obviously the Turks are clever enough to exploit and to maintain and to absorb um, and this kind of different even political and military organization that as you know was based uh, in the Muslim world especially in Anatolia in a very um, kind of band like I mean think of all this kind of Gazi principalities that were uh, basically because uh, we we talked uh, about this in those videos in the Muslim world that Anatolia was kind of the militarized frontier of Islam right it was the one that that since the beginning of the caliphate stayed at the at, at the outskirts of the same caliphate sometimes even populated by uh, <coughs> a radical erratic fringes that had fled the the major centers of power in in Mesopotamia and had uh, taken refuge there uh, I made a video I think it was the, the, the uh, caliphal armies or something like that in which you know you realize that uh, these were even wilder areas obviously I mean there is no comparison between the Anatolian plateau in terms of uh, uh, civil development etc and you know places like uh, what would be today's Iraq or Egypt, uh, etc. Obviously, it's a completely different world, right? Um, from one side, you have a centralized state, a professional army, uh, uh, pretty heavy bureaucracy, and central power. From the other side, you have basically what would be the same like in Europe in the 10th century all these scattered castles, minor lords, and that in this sense develop even a very kind of indi individualistic way of warfare that that, that is based uh, on this very harsh territory by the way uh, in uh, also on different types different doctrines if you want even based more on kind of guerrilla style uh, warfare raiding etc not you know consistent massive armies even though the Sultanate of Iconium obviously had this greater um, you know centralization capabilities as at the center of this land and having the, the, what resembled most more like a you know a great power right and and the history of, of this transition was particular because um the uh, basically the room so this land of the romans encompassed uh what would be today the world modern that is asian 
Turkey except the the Black Sea coast from the Bosphorus to the Georgian frontier. Uh, it also excluded Armenia and the uh, Jazira regions uh, to the east. Um, and the um, and and however by the, the the Byzantine revival of the mid um, uh, 12th century that will bring once again to, to the assault of of, of Iconium and the, the Battle of Myriokephalon, etc. Uh, uh, the uh, Islamic room only ran from the modern Turkish provinces of Malatya, I believe it's called, in the east to the iPhone in the west, right? And Amasia uh, in the north and Konya in the south, right? So the, the, the Byzantines had progressively kind of Re step by step, kind of uh, reconquered part of these territories. Then, uh, especially the eastern and mo more mountainous parts were ruled by the Danish Menets, as we were saying before, they were a dynasty that was eventually absorbed by the the same Seljuks of um, of Rum of of Iconia, uh, of Iconium or Konya, if you if you prefer. Um, that, uh, as we have seen, was ruling instead in the center of the Anatolian plateau, right? Um, and the, um, the, the, this, let's say, the, the world, uh, this world basically ends uh, by the 13th century, where there is the major, uh, you know, catastrophic event of the Mongol conquest that changes uh, a freaking lot of things. Um, that further actually fragments the situation, right? And before the emergence of the Ottomans, basically doesn't see any major power emerging. There are these Gazi states, that is, uh, basically these states dedicated to the defense and the extension of the Islamic territory, and also um, this word that if had already been difficultly controlled, now it's completely fragmented, and it's the same basically uh, milieu from which the same Ottoman state would, would be born at the end of, this, of the 13th century, right? By the way, in places that were highly and intensely Romanized, the Ottomans were uh, incredibly um, westernized uh, since the, the very beginning. Obviously, they, they owned this kind of very strong, especially initially, they, they, they looked like, like the average, um, the... Uh, Islamic Emirate or Beylik, uh, uh, as they they, they they were called, but they still stemmed from an area that was dramatically Westernized uh, in culture, in in mentality, etc. So that that also that's also what m made in many ways the uh, the strength uh, of the Ottoman state. That, however, rose uh, frankly by accident, and at least until the 20s and the 30s of the 15th century could be easily stopped. Let's be honest, the Ottoman Empire exists only because it's been harbored by the Westerners, uh, the Venetians, the, the Knights of Rhodes, uh, so the same Crusaders. And um, But that's another story, I made some videos about that, but this, this was just to give a bit of, of, of context. So, what is extremely interesting about the Islamic settlement in, in Anatolia is that um, it's um, uh, especially since the uh, first of all it began very early and and what we believe it was Islamic was not necessarily uh, and was not even properly Turkish uh, sometimes um, it th this settlement began actually much before by the um, actually by the, the early and the mid 11th century, right? And uh, and the, big, the, the ones who began actually to settle there were not Turks, but rather Kurds and other uh, Iranian uh, groups, including the Dailamis, for example. Um, and it's, however, later that the tribal Turkomans that uh, were, as we were saying before, barely under the control of the great Seljuks uh, of, of Iran, the, the sultans uh, of Iran, uh, really made this massive breakthrough after the, uh, especially the the Battle of Manzikert in in, in, t in 1071, right? Uh, and that's where these peoples began to, and they came really from a, from from anywhere at this point. Even the, the fact that the Seljuk Turks at this time were uh, heavily persified and they they had they, they were basically uh, you know they, they were 
in part obviously Turkish, ethnically speaking, but were completely Persianized at this point in language, culture, everything basically, including religion, because the Turks were pagans initially, and and now uh, obviously they they uh, became Muslims, and their their Islam was particularly um, loaded, by the way, with um, this kind of warrior culture, right? It's like it's a bit what happens even in certain regions during evangelization, Christianity, where you know, every people has a di- kind of a different reaction, to this kind of survival of, the, of their own ethos, morality, and tradition into the new faith that maybe tells something else. And in the case of the Turks, they were warriors by, by nature. They, they were this nomadic or semi-nomadic sometimes uh, peoples of Central Asia. You know, the, the, the idea of the struggle for the faith, the, the idea of fighting continuously having this, that is proper of Islam, it is a fort, because that's where, or s- even subjugation to this um, an escapable uh, duty to, of of the fate um, definitely fueled their even their military zeal. Right in in the video about the Battle of Manzikert, we have looked at, at all the uh, the very fascinating, I would say, mix of uh, in this in this sense of Islamic and at the same time of uh, sometimes pagan, however strictly you know. You know, nomadic traditions of of the steppes were mixed and and had this great importance in in all in in one all great meaning, right? So, but there were lots of other elements as well. You know, there were Turks that were maybe just come from from the steppes. Others that were I don't know settled in in Persia since centuries. So, these groups were very diversified. The same Iranian plateau is very ethnically diversified. Uh, they are not just the Iranians, by the way. Um, so uh, you can imagine the that that uh, this is important to to tell because you know before talking about the Byzantines and the Franks in the Seljukid ranks, um, the uh, it, it's important to understand how mi- heavily and massively mixed the Islamic world was actually, in way more than the the Christian world. The, the, the European world was fairly, you know, ethnically well well defined. The Islamic world was this unstoppable continuation of of ethnic mix. And it's incredible. The same Turks, by the way, even, you know, through other channels that were not necessarily Islamic, but think about the same Turks of the steppes. Sometimes we call these people Turks, and we think that they were actual, you know, that that particular Ugrophenic branch of, that you can't identify linguistically or even ethnically speaking, but these were populations that were uh, mixed since the millennia between Indo-Europeans and, and Ugrofins, in fact. And, and, and so when, when you say that these were Turks, yes, they were Turks, because the, 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 the only way to recognize yourself in the steppe is what kind of language you speak, so to which law, basically, uh, you, under which law you are. But you might have come easily from an Aryan uh, clan that was subjugated by that power and that joined, etc. So there is nothing strange in imagining part of this Turks actually very, uh, even in terms of appearance, very fair, uh, you know, blue-eyed, blonde, red-haired. Yeah, that, that's massively unknown uh, without mentioning that the uh, as Gulams, as um, you know, or Mamluks, as you prefer, as this kind of serve soldiers, slave soldiers, uh, they were recruited from everywhere. Like it was normal for the caliphate to hire immediately people coming from Caucasus, from the Slavic world, from Europe, from from Black Africa, from from literally everywhere. And the only gluing factor was Islam. That's the real point. That's re- obviously you know that was not the only gluing factor, as, you, as we were saying at the beginning of of the video. It's uh, always about you know source of uh, sources uh, of power you know who pays you for being a mercenary a mercenary fundamentally and obviously especially now the Islamic world by the eleventh century is fairly uh, in crisis but uh, uh, you know ever since the the Gulen practice started in the previous centuries you know the, the Islam was kind of the, the most advanced area in at least in the Western Eurasia and it, it had that's where the money was where the gold was was power was states were civilization etc and, and obviously these populations would flow in there right uh, so even the concept of slave uh, soldier is being you know especially in Western historiography is being called 
define like ah this this were just a bunch of slaves treated like dogs and all well actually not the the concept of the ghulam and of the mamluk is 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 way uh more resembling like the, the relation between a you know i don't know the what what the i don't know in the christian world for example now where the the uh, familia of the uh of the noblemen of of the lords that yeah had basically people that were juridically not free under their command but that basically sometimes were even wealthier and more powerful than the average peasantry was nominally free but uh from a juridical point of view but that were starving to death compared to these guys who actually had a f fairly favorable treatments in the gulams including the seljuks obviously came to rule basically the the caliphate the seljuks taking into hostage basically uh, the caliphate of Baghdad and they claim okay we are the great protectors of the fate of the Muslim world but the fact that they were controlling this uh, now that the caliphate was almost completely devoid of, of, of power so that's also the, the great power of the Seljuks and how they developed this pretty big and astonishingly important empire that is overlooked in great part and that is instead one of the most um, you know, important, but also the the, the of, of the time, but also the Seljuks fragment. There is nothing stable in here. I mean, as long as you control a an area like the one of Iran, uh, it's fine. Also Mesopotamia, but you know, you at this time there are no powers, no that can really extend a uh, solid control over large amounts of of, of land, right? And when you look at those stupid nationalistic maps like, you know, the Seljuk Empire stretching literally from Turkey to, to India, I don't know how, well, you know, encompassing everywhere, like, that that's like a, a myth, right? It, it's not factual history, even though we are we are disgustingly overloaded with with fanatics that, that show the stuff, that, that's not really how it worked. Um, nevertheless, and I don't remember who was making this point, uh, well, whatever. It, it It's still, however, to see that, oh, yeah, that there was a kind of a similar trend, if you want, in this centuries. If you're taking parallel what, what was happening in Europe, sort of progressive feudalization that contributed to, to this fragmentation, paradoxically. Uh, this is particularly even, especially in the, the, the Islamic world, because the same Seljuks... Uh, the Seljuks are a bit, just to make you an example... Uh, that obviously it's like prox approximated. It's like a bit like the, the the Vikings that become Franks in Normandy, right? They're they're populations that come from the far world of the north that were originally um, pagans and they, they settle into these systems that are mo way more advanced than, than their own. But they're able to you know uh, master them at one point, uh, and in this case with feudalism. You know the Normans in Normandy are managed to export f a, a, an extremely more efficient feudalism than the French one. The kingdoms of Sicily and of England are the most uh, functional kingdoms in high medieval Europe. And there is no absolute di doubt about this. Well, the Seljuks do s something similar with Iran. That is um, traditionally uh, basically a, a feudal land it, it was traditionally for reasons now I'm not starting to explain something extremely different from Iraq for example it was uh, kind of a more centralized and uh, like the Byzantine Empire to, to assume it that it had a real state and a real center right so the Seljuk Empire also exports just like the, the Normans did if you want uh, this um, feudal model um, everywhere like that, that entails the decentralization in parts and unavoidably brings to obviously the, the 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 muslim world has i would say much greater difficulty to create a stable political unity than it happens in europe actually and the, but this is something maybe we will talk in another time i made some videos that compare these two systems um but it's remarkable in many ways because for example the Franks, let's say, because the Normans at this point are Franks as much as the, the Seljuks are Persians, basically. Um, so the Franks and the, the Seljuks will, that will meet, for example, during the Crusades, will share, for this very reason, for this sort of feudal system that they both 
are imbued with many similarities, chiefly the fact that they fo fight on horseback, so that in spite, you know, the, the history of the Crusades is a history of of extreme violence and at the same time of extreme friendliness, um, of, of extreme friendship and, and civil understanding, and and and, uh, and, and it, it, there's a great much of this. And in fact, Franks and Seljuks respect each other. They respect the code of chivalry, uh, essentially. That was true in there. That was uh, broadly existing even before, obviously, the Seljuk times. That, that there are many, you know, much of courtly culture. Uh, in Christian Europe comes from you know early you know Omayyad Spain for example there are similar themes there is the uh, there is a, a similar concept of to, to one of chivalry in, in, in to, to, to the Muslim world actually so this is just to introduce to you to the idea that we're not talking about when we talk about Byzantines and Franks into these armies we we're not thinking of complete strangers that come from a radically different um, background and mindset and that cannot understand each other. It, it's perfectly normal to have something like that in these particular contexts, right? Um, so, um, however, as we were saying before, it's the Turkomans that really, so the, the, this nomadic tribal warriors that, that, that represent the bulk of, of peoples, the, 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 the people that settle in Anatolia. And from a strictly military point of view, especially from the uh, mid um, the twelfth, uh, thirteenth, thirteenth um, century, so before the Mongolian conquest, when we look at the Seljuks of of Rome, we observe that their military organization is remarkably similar still to the great Sel Seljuks of Iran, right? Um, the Byzantine influence in their military organization is really less obvious, right? Um, and the, the 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 reason here is that because it, this is a very hotly debated topic, right? There is no s uh, clarity, let's say, in, in whether uh, in um, you know how strong the Byzantine influence eventually was in Logan here in Anatolia to, to Seljuk armies. Uh, we can see, as we were saying before, by the early 13th century, a sort of, you know, uh, especially military administration, something that was evidently brought in part from, uh, you know, taken from the Byzantine legacy, but not in terms of tactics or equipment, right? So that's why uh, today, by looking at the, the armor that we're going to study, we will try to you know to make a question mark like put, put a question mark like is it true or not we, we will see that um, and we know that however there was uh, plenty uh, of Byzantine soldiers and Greek prisoners of war that served in the Seljuk armies right and um, as much as those troops that were recruited among uh, from among men of, mi of mixed uh, Greek and Turkish descent into Anatolia. Right? Um, so, the, um, the it's obvious that before this period, roughly between the 11th and 14th century, there is some Byzantine influence in the system, but it's mostly administrative, for, for as much as, uh, as long as we can see. Um, and N the the Sel Seljuk army in uh, in the Sultanate of Rome um, developed fundamentally by the mid 13th century as a you know a solid bulk of, of tribal Turkmens, uh, the elite of which was composed um, uh, especially of the Gulams, also in here the this, this uh, slave soldiers that now were actually. Uh, formally slave. Uh, I mean, we were talking about the German ministerialists the other day, observing how, even in that case, yeah, th those guys were not freemen. German knighthood was marked by uh, ju uh, juridical serfdom, but as a matter of fact, they were basically um, as powerful sometimes, even major local noblemen. So, in in the case of the the, the, the Seljuk world, in here, it's 
pretty similar, and it's interesting even even to compare. Um, however, uh, there were also uh, there, were, there were also other forms of um, recruitment. Some were resembling fundamentally feudalism, with fiefs known as ik, uh, ikta, I believe they they were called, that were that is lands that were given uh, in return for military service. And coming to the point where lots of uh, mercenaries, uh, some were naturally from the same Anatolia that was like imagine the Far West. Right? That that was practically it, both in terms of you know that was the average raiding, cattle raiding, uh, things like that. M major military expeditions were fairly rare, so it was a, a much lack of a frontier warfare into which even the uh, as you know both in the Byzantine and the Turkish tradition the uh, horse archery was pretty pretty advanced pretty functional to that kind of strategic theater um, but there were however lots of um, external at this point uh, mercenaries mm -hmm. um, Western Europeans so-called Frankish mercenaries, right? Um, and um, interestingly enough, for w what we can tell in terms of Islamic uh, equipment, strictly speaking, uh, the gulams um, of the Seljuk, uh, of the Sultanate of Rome, were pretty much uh, pretty much indistinguishable from the gulams and, and mamluks of of the of the rest of the near and middle and especially actually middle eastern islamic states i mean if you look at uh even at a map of the mashrek what what you have is this great kind of mountainous area that stretches from from turkey then goes into caucasus then goes down once again in, in into the iranian plateau so uh, even places that kind of resembled each other in some ways, in terms of material, cultural, social, organization, the idea of feudalism was something that existed far back in the day, from the times of of the Persians. Even Armenia had a solid kind of of, of, of feudal um, system, um, uh, in this sense. And um, when it comes to Byzantine or even Western European influence in equipment, we have to be a bit more more cautious, right? Um, when we look at these, uh, for example, at the mercenaries, also consider this, that today we will concentrate on the Byzantines and the Franks. Um, however, there were many other ethnicities fighting for the Turks in, 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 in Anatolia, like Georgians were seemingly very present, uh, the uh, Russians, yes, there were Russians fighting for the Seljuks in Anatolia, Arabs, Greeks, Armenians, um, Khorasmians, um, the Kip uh, Chaks, so these populations of, of the steppes that stretched also kind of Turkish uh, origin, fairly at least th there is a huge debate on this, the Kurds that we mentioned before, the Dailamis, right, and other um, Iranians. And as we will see now, Europeans were very numerous really very numerous. It was uh, full of Frenchmen, Germans, um, uh, uh, also Italians, and it, it seems in fact that um, many of them would simply join willingly even to as mercenaries into the Muslim armies, especially after the decline of the Crusader states uh, in the 13th century because, you know, yeah, the, the kind of the this Crusader kingdoms are, are lost, but people just want to keep to work and therefore they, they get hired by the Muslim principalities. What's wrong with that? That it was perfectly done. So another proof that you know religious factors are kind of uh, very uh, you know very debatable as a real uh, element. And uh, the other auxiliaries were also represented by the Bedouins. Some of them came as far as Arabia or maybe even some from other areas like uh, Africa, for example. Uh, the Kurds uh, were these sort of uh, hill people uh, coming from the mountainous districts of north and west Iran that had this kind of very 
um, you know, Marco Polo s says that they had a sort of lust for, for fighting. They were kind of lawless, fond of robbing. So, and much of warfare was based on that. That's why, before I was recalling in the, the um, orographic, let's say, the, the environmental s similarities between these lands, because after all, it doesn't matter what, what language you spoke, but uh, in that particular context, everybody had to do that in a way um, uh, or in another. And um, the um, there were naturally many. Uh, th there was a lot of contact also with places like Syria, um, Mesopotamia, of course. Uh, just think about the same uh, fact that you know uh, Alp Arslan before the Battle of Manzikert was simply camping <laughs> exactly in there in, in, in Syria, etc. So th there was this, however, this bridge still between the. Anatolia and the um, and the, the, the source, the spring, let's say, of, of Iran. However, however, this was probably what the, the, the further most most decentralized area, right? And that everybody had a tough time to control. Uh, both the, the Seljuks, then eventually the, the Mamluks, basically never never reached there. The Mongols arrived there, but they have kind of retreat then. The Timurids tried, etc. And this decentralization also is also kind of convenient because it, it's way better to have a fragmented area than a potential competitor like the Ottomans will rise, effectively, you know, wiping out the Mamluks one day, etc. So, um, however, th there was still this uh, influence, especially of the steppe sometimes, of the steppe broadly meant, even in the Mongol tradition of the 13th century, in military equipment, I even the, the political form etc obviously these these lands were in contact even with with, with places like the ukraine or kazakhstan uh, uh you know where the, the golden horde would remain think about all the attachment the re reverence that the ottomans formally maintained uh re you know as, as uh, being reminiscent of the great can of um you know of towards this um post uh, let's say these successors of uh, Genghis Khan uh, Empire, right? So, um, for what it concerns uh, the the, um, the 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 the, the, uh, the troops, especially the Western ones, now uh, we see that under the Sultans. Uh, look, let's look chiefly at the 13th century because the 13th century kind of a better documented time, so we know fairly more about this period than others. But we will eventually list all the contingents that we find of Frankish origin of other uh, areas in Seljuk service. Uh, in um, um, the, the Sultanate of Rome had a sort of revival in this century. Especially under the Sultan Sky Kobad the first between that ruled between uh, 1220 and 1237 and Kai Kosru uh, the the second 1237 uh, 1246 Kai Kosru here it's obviously a name uh, uh, reminding us the the even the the, the Sasanian tradition in term that that tells you how how strong um, Persian influence really was. And and this was a monetary revival in which the, uh, the 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 sultans of Rome managed to render vassal certain states like uh, Cilician uh, Armenia, um, even the uh, Byzantine held territory of Trebizond. That is important because remember what I was talking about at the beginning: the, the fact that these um, coastal centers of 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 what was formerly the Byzantine Empire were kind of even um, you know engaging into autonomous diplomatic relations with the with with other powers like in this case paying a tribute was perfectly normal because naturally the you know at this point the Sultanate of Rome is kind of the, the largest power in there so obviously Trebizond doesn't have to wait for Constantinople to, to for having an okay they kind of already behave a bit on their own for being uh, protected etc and believe and tribute here is the um the the average cash through which political relations are paid uh 
it's normal. I mean, the, the whole medieval system at this point is based on tribus. That is to say, you know, uh, your power is based on, on who you manage to make you make pay you, right? And it, and it always happens. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean actually that you pay for because you're weaker. Uh, I mean, obviously, yeah, the tendency is that, but, you know, even the Byzantine Empire subsidized, I don't, I don't know, certain powers, not because they were now complete threat, but maybe because they they didn't want them to create more mess than, than, than the usual. So it was a kind of um, perfect, perfectly normal, right? Um, and the, um, there is Simon de Saint-Quentin, um, a Frankish visitor to Rome in the 40s of the 13th century that um, recorded um, that under, uh, you know, Kai uh, Kosru, um, the Armenians owed him um, 1,400 lances uh, in service for four months a year, which is a freaking lot, like four months for 1,400 cavalry. Now, Armenian Cilicia w w was not uh, it was not small, but you know. F by the way, those four months are even, I guess, you know, uh, you know, to, to be owed in in the best season. So, what practically monopolized the the entire military activity, uh, given that we're still in a largely seasonal way of war. Doesn't matter how in much in this century there is a pro progressive mon monetarization, professionalization that entails longer periods of of military activity by groups of professionals, but this already tells you that probably these were mercenaries and they were not really, you know, um, cavalry bred into, you know, the, I don't know, the heart of Cilician um, nobility, but just, just, just my guess. Um, interestingly enough, at this point, uh, the Seljuks of, of Rome also get 1,000 lances by the Sultan of Aleppo, right? It was never one of the major powers in the Islamic world, but was, you know, something that all, it was a pretty, had been on, on the frontier against the Crusaders, they had, a, you know, pretty warlike, normally, uh, power. And even 400 lances by the Emperor of, of Nicaea. That is to say, basically, the, the Paleologoi that are this branch of uh, what is left of the Byzantine Empire after the Crusader conquest into into Asia Minor, like uh, today's uh, Western Turkey, um, and two hundred lances by the vassals of Trebizond. Interestingly enough, so here you realize that indeed being the major power could in, in, in Anatolia now, especially after the disgregation of the of the Byzantine Empire, that, that was particularly important. Eventually, as you know, the, 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 the Empire of Nicaea is, manages to, to reconquer Constantinople to the Crusaders, but uh, it's obvious that, you know, uh, uh, you know having the, the Empire wiped out, and doesn't matter whether replaced by the Latin Empire, that was still something that uh, enormously, ad, uh, you know, created an enormous advantage for the uh, for the um, for the Sultanate of Rome, that by the way had had this phase of Mongolian uh, shock. That, that you know, that in the Islamic world, the the, Mon uh, the Mongolians represent really what you know the the, catas the total catastrophe, right? The Crusaders, you know, the Crusaders had not really scared Muslims pretty much. The, the Muslims it seems that culturally speaking, they they didn't quite even get the the, the near you know the the full threat that they the Crusaders posed to them. They just, you know, yeah, of course they 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 got. But the, it, w what really shocked them radically from a cultural point of view was was the Muslim invasion, and it is indeed uh, obviously more. Uh, it's obviously understandable. Um, the so uh, the. The what we were talking about the pay before these troops, um, Bar Hebreus tells us that um, the uh, the Kai uh, Kosro actually in in 1243 hired um, certain 
cavalry from both Aleppo and Byzantines, as well as certain Bedouins for gold, specifically. So as we were saying before, this isn't just properly, you know, um, you know, it was probably a much more fluid world where even this, uh, you know, all in troops was not that you really sent your own vassals to, to these guys. They basically sometimes might have been as well a simply monetary transition, uh, I believe, I suppose. So uh, through which you could in turn pay these guys. Naturally, we have seen the numbers that we that have been given before. They're, they're not a few, and probably they're even inflated by by certain. Uh, degree, but um, it, it is important even to deprive yourself of such troops in your own territory, even if they're not really under your your command. You know, giving them the permission to, as your subject, to go there and fight for this um, this other uh, power. Uh, now we don't we're not talking about the amount of the rest of this Seljuk troops, also because they are. Uh, you know, it's always kind of complicated to tell how many there there were. The sources are sometimes grossly inflating the numbers most of the times. So we have numbers like 60,000 uh, 60, men. I really doubt that the Sultanate of Rome could, could levy something like 60,000 men, right? Let's be honest about it. Um, the at uh, this time, uh, you know, even a kingdom like the one of France, I think, could couldn't really raise. I mean, one one thing is, couldn't raise more than 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 you know, couple of thousands of of cavalry at at once. You know, one thing because much of these numbers are even theoretical in the base of how many fiefs you have and therefore how many troops theoretically you can field, but it, it's it's theoretical. They they couldn't be fielded all at once. There simply weren't the means, and even if there had it been, you would have burned them immediately. So, obviously, uh, armies were much smaller. But still, the fact that we have these large numbers uh, tells us uh, that that these powers were definitely uh, at least they, they had a solid potential, and they and they earned a reputation for their military capability. Uh, so, talking specifically about D. Um, so, here, first of all, the Byzantines. We we have said that there are troops now that were really Byzantine mercenaries proper. And this is interesting, because now, basically, after the fall of the, of the empire, uh, the, the Byzantine-held territories are uh, dramatically... Westernized and feudalized, and I'm not talking just about you know the Byzantine land, meaning you know what what was occupied by the Latin Empire. I'm talking literally about the places that the 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 Westerners didn't come to occupy, but that were equally uh, under a very heavy Western influence. We know that since the Comnenian dynasty, the uh, the the Western influence is massive. Uh, the the presence even of Western commanders. People coming from uh, Western mercenaries, sorry, people coming uh, from from all, all over Europe, Western Europe, basically, uh, and that were required by the same Byzantines. Actually, if you look at the Battle of Manzikert, that's pretty obvious that um, what uh, the same Crusaders were basically a sort of response to 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 Constantinople that wasn't asking actually for what the Crusaders were turned out to be, but rather for uh, for mercenaries, I can hear um, that that could come in in these to fight, and we've seen about a campaign of massacre. It was full of 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 Franks in there in the Byzantine army. So, and we're talking about a period that is previous to the Crusade. It, it's, a, it's like a generation before the Crusade. So, even this idea that uh, from one side, you know, the, 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 as if nobody traveled, nobody, you know, the Middle Ages was sort of dark hole where nobody moved, etc. Um, mercenarism is um, means that throughout the world history, that you can't find troops of any country fighting everywhere. I mean, look at what's been Syria now or, or the Ukraine. Mercenaries are everywhere, and mercenaries bring with them different ideas, different uh, different techniques, experiences, etc. They 
sometimes, very often, if you know, if they don't get killed, they come back where they, they come from, they go serving someone else. Well, it was exactly like that, even before the Crusades. So the Westerners perfectly knew those places. Actually, uh, even before the Crusades, uh, we know that you know, it was full of Westerners accompanying pilgrims into Seljuk-held territory of, I don't know, Jerusalem, etc. How do you think the Normans... Uh, I don't know, uh, created an empire in Sicily. They went there like Vikings, whoa, whoa, whoa uh, download, uh, you know, um, uh, unloading their troops from ships and sacking, etc., and popping out there. Those were contractors that escorted pilgrims from southern Italy. They had to go to, to the Holy Land. They went there with them. Think about the, I don't know, English, uh, Scandinavian troops in service of the the imperial guard of Constantinople. Think about that, that, you know, Vikings arriving up to the Caspian Sea. This was a world where you could find literally everyone everywhere. Uh, so the myth even of, oh, from one side we had this block, from one side these others, ah, the, the, these troops were so radical, like the, the, the Muslim world was from one side, the Christians from one other. It's, uh, it's a myth. It doesn't exist in reality. Um, you could find uh, people of most diverse religions fighting in all the armies around there. And it was normal. What do you think about the Saracens were? Do you think the Saracens were just, you know, kind of Arab-looking guys that that, that uh, went raiding around from the southern shores of the Mediterranean? Were all, only Muslims? And they that was it? Saracens were... F- Many Saracens were Christians. Do you think in the Eastern Mediterranean, in, during the Saracen period, you can distinguish between a uh, an Arab Muslim or a Greek Christian? Do you think there is any way to determine that? We don't know. Most of the times, they were all mixed, and that's what pirates do. You know, you pirates do it for loot. They, they don't care what they're doing it for. These were things that were covered with, you know religious ideals by name to get maybe sanctioned in their power by the faraway caliphate to say okay well I recognize you like like a government but the people who did this were people coming literally from everywhere that is not to say that obviously the Saracens were mostly coming from from uh, Muslim held countries at least but just those countries had been previously Christian for example and most of the people were absolutely n- not forcefully converted. They even started joining the Muslims in their raids, even in, th- in their conquest since the very beginning. Uh, how do you think the Arabs conquered half of Mediterranean? Because they 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 broke through with what? With their ridiculous demographic strength. They opened their gates for goodness sake. They didn't want to pay taxes to Constantinople. That was a pretty clever thing to do despite of what some ideologue would like to make you think. Uh, because guess what? Humans do things for reasons that are fairly valid. You can't debate as much as you like, but you can't judge after 1,000 years pretending that you're somehow morally superior to these people because of what? Because you're a moron that has been born in a place where, you know, doesn't have even to work to, 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 to eat and to spend his whole fucking life uh, uh, glued to a smartphone. You're not superior, you're just garbage. That's what you are. Um, secondly, uh, the um, going to this list of troops, um, there's, there is an actually an amazing amount of Frankish mercenaries in the, in the sel- uh, Sultanate of Rome in the, uh, from the 12th, 13th century. And probably there were already before, as we have seen. The it seems that as early as 1148, uh, there were 3,000 Franks that were captured at Atalaya, so in, in the south of Turkey, basically, during the Second Crusade, that eventually took service under Sultan Masud I. So these were not only... Uh, Franks, but there were people who had come there during the crusade that got captured and decided to serve it to, to, to sell their services 
to the local sultan, right? Um, um, the sultan Kai Kaos actually formed a bodyguard unit from Franks that he had liberated after the victories over rival Muslim chieftains. That is to say that these were guys who were fighting for the Muslims that got captured by other Muslims and started serving other Muslims. These were Franks. These were people coming from Western Europe. Right? Uh, we're talking about the 12th century. Um, under Caicos Ru's army, so we here we are in the 13th century, uh, at the very beginning of his reign, by the way, we have at least 1,000 Frankish cavalry. Um, and that it's thanks to sim seemingly 300 of these Franks that a very serious Turkoman revolt was put down in 1241. This is also typical of the period. Basically, you hire uh, heathens. People were, do not share your fate, because guess what? It's not about fate, it's about politics. And uh, in the Islamic world, it was a, a very convenient excuse to basically claim that you were not fit um, to for you know your role of uh, you know of God's servant basically because maybe you had been defeated so God had basically said that you were incapable to to rise you know in the Islamic world there is this contempt towards um, uh, secular authority because in in many ways it's put under much heavier criticism than it, it is in the Christian world that it's kind of a supported generally speaking of, of um, of whatever is established politically speaking, including, by the way, governments that are kind of uh, different from your own, even religiously, which is kind of interesting. It's something that dates back to Judaism. Um, and um, so by hiring... Uh, so, and obviously, this had a... You know, if you hire a foreigner, it's normally someone who doesn't, you know, belong to the place. You, you, know, you can obviously settle him down etc but you um, you can um, you know normally it's not that easy to form like a bulk of, of people that have, they will mix down and yeah there were sacks of even a, you know Christian elements all, all over the, this Muslim territories but it's not because I don't know the local Franks will create some someone else in there um, even though, and I remember that I didn't finish that thing I said before about the Byzantines. I say there were lots of these guys, and, and the problem is that they don't care about your religious stuff because they are there just because of your money, right? And the fact that they're not involved in the local policy and religion, etc., it's obviously very convenient for you because they don't give a damn. They're not there because they're not even legitimated to take power. Sometimes they do, you know, like it can be tricky sometimes, but um, it seems it doesn't happen very often, right? Uh, at least they're gonna be much more faithful and loyal servant in a you know a religiously dominated you know uh, in a in a territory that is dominated by another religion you will not really be able to to overthrow like it's like with the Muslims in the service of Frederick the Second of Owenstaufen. Well, in there you see that basically he is very clever because uh, these guys were kind of a minority in Sicily that were creating problems were still theoretically Muslims, at least mixed origin. They maybe were autochthonous Sicilians, we don't know, but they they get taken by Frederick II and confined in one city. That is something they had never had in, in a fully Christian territory uh, in, in southern Italy. So obviously these guys, all, all they have in terms even of local autonomy, etc., to this sovereign in a land that normally... Uh, you know, it's not very friendly to you because you're you're a heathen, right? So that's the best way to have very faithful troops. And it turns out, in fact, the Saracens of Lucera were under Frederick II, some of the finest troops he trusted most, right? Um, for this reason, and the same goes in Muslim territory. All these Christians are not dangerous because they cannot become Muslim leaders. They, they can't, but they're pretty effective. And in that case, in 1241, we see that they put down this Turkoman revolt. Remember the Gazis, you know, all these bands of 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 uh, fate warriors, basically that were sometimes nothing but 
uh, more years, right? They, they went raiding enemy lands by saying, okay, we're doing it in the name of Islam, but as a matter of fact, we're usually usual robbers you could find in any other place in the world doing the same exact thing, because guess what? That's what human beings do most of the time, so there is not a low and centralized government to stop you there. So these are pretty nasty and a pain in behind. So this guy takes 300 Frankish uh, troops and slaughters them. Pretty intelligent. I mean, who wouldn't do that? Who wouldn't have fun to do it, actually? <laughs> now that I was just quoting uh, a movie. But the uh, that's important. These are big numbers. And, and, and you realize that these, are, these, troop, these Frankish troops are protagonists in the story. Um, but in tw uh, in twelve of two years after, we know uh, that um, Kai um, Kosrus the second actually employs other two thousand Frankish um, uh, troops that were present at Kuzadag uh, in his army. So and these Franks, but who were? Because actually, were when we talk about Franks, we we don't. You know, it's pretty, it's a synecdoche, right? It's like Norman, it's like Turk. You know, what does it really mean that these are people coming? Hell no, these are people coming in turn from many other lands. When you talk about Franks, you're basically talking about every single person that it, that can, it can be French, German. Uh, you don't really know. Uh, another term was the, the Latins, you know, that usually what the Byzantines told about the wool. Uh, the the Catholics, I mean, the ones that were under the the papacy of Rome, religiously. Uh, it's like the Normans that conquered England. You think they were Normans? I mean, many of them were, of course, the bulk, but it was plenty of Bretons. It was plenty of Flemish. It, as far as we know, there were people who could come literally from everywhere. The the, the carpenters that built Nor uh, um, William William the First fleet were Byzantines. Come supposedly from there from Constantinople for, for doing it. So it's a bit like here, that they could come really from many other places, and it turns out that this latter contingent of 2,000 francs was mainly con um, consisting of Cypriots, um, considering that um, Cyp um, Cyprus, actually, or Cyprus, I don't know how to say also owed service to the Sultanate roughly around this, this time. So it's not, it's not so surprising, after all, you know, that Cyprus had been occupied by these crusaders that had been a, um, originally a Byzantine-held territory, and it was seized, eventually. And uh, it was a pretty important base, by the way, because just facing the uh, the Outremer states, and, and in fact the same Anatolian uh, coast, was rich in some some uh, goods as well so that's uh, and uh, in this case they were uh, Cypriots but as we said before most of these Frankish mercenaries were basically French German and Italian that's what the nationality is. that is lots of French Germans and Italians serving into 13th century Seljuk armies by the way, consider that I made a video on this that um, at this time, a bit everywhere, you know, there was an increase of professionalization and the creation of bands of mercenaries going literally everywhere. There is a, a much higher social mobility. Uh, Western Europeans were going to um, serve even, you know, east uh, in, in a broader sense, just in the direction. Hungary, for example, was a place just much as is the Byzantine Empire, where you find lots of people settled, even hell, you know, I know I've read, I think of, in Hungary, you know, that there were uh, English, Spanish, Italian knights that were settled as uh, as as uh, f uh, feudatories of, of the Hungarian king. So uh, that's the horizons you have to consider. Not the tiny, bigoted, uh, narrow Middle Ages of local places where everybody is trying to, uh, you know, live within the, its its uh, stinky hut. That's not really how the Middle Ages were. 
sorry for the spoiler. And interestingly enough, also there is an appearance, uh, an appearance of certain uh, titles um, within the ranks of these Western mercenaries in the Seljuk armies that are things like Condistable. That is obviously constable, right? Um, and by the way, uh, and this is very interesting, uh, this was not seemingly part of the inner organization of these mercenaries, but it was really a mutuated title that um, was given um, as the uh, you know to to the military leader of these troops, whoever he was. It couldn't even not be a Frank. It could be someone else. We you know, for example, that. The, in the 13th century, um, there was a Georgian constable of the Frankish uh, militia known as Zari, uh, Zahi Rudaula. Right? And even the future Byzantine emperor Michael VIII was condestable under Sultan Kaikos II. Yes. A, form, uh, a future Byzantine emperor that was a uh, officer of foreign troops under an Islamic army. Uh, why is it strange? Shouldn't be. Military history at that time is literally all like this. I mean, it, this is not an exception. You say, oh, well, it's weird. No, it was the normality. It was the total normality, and this is obvious for anyone, at least who, who knows about the political diplomatical military relations between all these powers was all about convenience about pragmatism how do you think you're gonna survive on the basis of which you know well let's skip this and in in Turkish I guess uh, the name of Franks were the uh, or, or Frankish better is Firenk right Firenk and the um the average, uh, this is actually pretty pretty interesting because it's uh, another transliteration, obviously. And the, let's, let me check one second, this damn thing is so slow. Stupid connection. I'm looking at something. However, um, the... And and this is where, where it gets actually cool because this Firank seemingly included was a, a real synecdoche. That is to say, it was a term used to define basically the every kind of this Western-like troops. In fact, it seems that among the free Firanks, th there were also Greek elements. That is to say that what here in the title, for example, we distinguished as Byzantines and and Franks, right? Actually, were all together under this Firank group, right? Right. So it was really um, very easily uh, summed up, but it's not really an approximation, because as I was saying before, what happened in the Byzantine Empire by the 12th, 13th century is the massive and radical uh, westernization of their armies. Uh, even if you look at the Akritai, all these troops were kind of, uh, you know, namely garrisons of the empire, but this time not differently, basically, to a, to a western feudal lord that was settled in a frontier to, to guard a castle, you know, that was even starting to reason like a westerner, reading western literature, playing western music, you know, all the Byzantine what we call as Byzantine music. There was nothing like Byzantine music, for example, in the secular sense. Byzantine music is, by definition, exclusively ecclesiastical music, religious music. All those other um, music that you hear, uh, rep uh, sometimes reproduced, there, there are lots of people who do this, were, were not actually Byzantine. They were stuff taken by places like southern France. Um, this... Uh, massive cultural, um, you know, emanators. I don't know how to say that. They were 
at this point investing literally everywhere, Southern Germany, Italy, uh, Byzantine Empire, everywhere, like in this courtly models. And everything was kind of going to that direction. Um, um, it, 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 it was this kind of crossroad with the Byzantine history where some some emperors even trying to say, okay, let's try to, to feudalize a bit more this empire because it seems to that, that that is actually more flexible. Michael the First Comnenus was, for example, one of um, uh, one of these. Uh, excuse me, Emmanuel the First uh, Comnenus was one of the greatest promoters of this um, Westernization. Much of this Byzantine troops now would be extremely similar to Westerners, and guess why? Because some of them were Westerners themselves. Uh, the Byzantine-held territories of Nicaea and the western coast of Turkey were actually people coming from everywhere in Western Europe. People who had been settled there. Why? Because they, they were hired by the, the Palaiologoi as mercenaries. And then these people, they, they, normally they didn't have, absolutely, they, the empire didn't have any money to pay them, as it's regular in any moment. <laughs> like, and they paid them simply with land. So that they enfeathed uh, into the, these regions, and it's obvious that even during the clashes between uh, the Byzantines and the Turks or whoever, these guys would basically switch sides. Like you know, if your fifth is there, you start raising like a lord. You transition from one to another, and everything was usually very progressive. So and that's how it happens. I wouldn't be surprised if many of these troops actually could even get Muslim at one point. We know that, we'll see that afterwards, especially with the Martulos um, in the Ottoman Empire, you know, that those were basically Christians that uh, were the, the ancient, Gre I mean, Byzantine settlers that were Christian, initially speaking, progressive, that they, they grow Muslim into, especially in, actually in early medieval, excuse me, in early modern um, Turkey, I mean, the Ottoman Empire. Um, and um, this is particularly important, in my opinion. The so okay, an other name that you can find sometimes is Kafir Sipahiler, right? So Kafir Sipahiler should be in Turkish, if I'm not wrong. Yes, it's in Turkish because you I mean search from certain articles. Basically, means Kafir means heathen. Right, and Sipahiler means uh, this like the Sipa. It's it's an, uh, fundamentally a knight proper. It was different from the uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, we're called the Ajik, uh, Ajiking, something like that. Were more like horse archers. This kind of lighter rabble of horse are of light horse archers of the typical of the Turkmen bands that were the same ones we were talking about before. But it, the the Sipa is kind of the the equivalent of the Western Miles, right? He's the knight. And Kafir Sipailer simply these guys they were heathens. They were not Muslims. Uh, they were Christian and they uh, they were higher. They were considered Sipais, <laughs> like the others, because that's what the term uh, actually means, right? And um, and so as we were saying, there were Greek elements as well that were sometimes employed from the Archontes and the Akritai of the empire, as we were saying. So the Archontes were, if I'm not wrong, this kind of uh, local governors that were um, kind of political military managers of the district, basically, of governors of the district. The Akritai was, they were the, this kind of frontier uh, what be, would be the Chatelain, right? You know, the guy was put in that castle to keep it and to, to guard it, to live like a knight, fundamentally. Um, yes, and, and naturally you have to put in account, as we did at the beginning of the video, those Greek subjects that fell into under Turkish domination. Right? They were Christians, they were living there, they were there from who knows when the Romans, after all, had, uh, I mean, the Greeks even obviously before way before had been living into into Anatolia since you know first millennium BC. So there were populations who were 
deeply rooted in there. That the, obviously the the Seljuks had no interest to deprive themselves, especially after, you know, especially demographic resources at this time were were something not to be undervalued. Now, a, a great problem was for fielding armies, especially in the 11th, 12th century, was not much money themselves was agricultural resources, but also people who could produce them. That is, you have to have a po uh, uh, enough people, enough enough population to provide the resources and to go to war. So that's why even certain defeats like Manzikert if for, for the Byzantines, but others in general at this time, it, it's not that they are um, much catastrophic for, for for the amount of bloodshed, but because you know even you know some hundreds of of troops were very difficult to replaceable in a short amount of time. So naturally, even these Christian subjects were obviously discriminated in the sense that there were different regulations for Muslims and for Christians, but they would basically participate to, to Muslim armies for, for obvious reasons and needs of manpower. And don't think that these guys were so, you know, uh, you know, obviously we know of atrocities committed by both sides, so obviously there was some hatred and and contempt, but in general... At one point, these troops, if they wanted at least to participate to the army, they, they had to be somewhat integrated and necessarily cooperating. And obviously, some of them had all the interest to do it, because maybe, I don't know, the local government was lighter uh, under, the, under the Muslims than under the Byzantines. It kind of happened. Uh, so... That's obvious, and um, and it's uh, as much as it's obvious that the same Byzantines and Crusaders made made extensive use of of Muslim mercenaries. That's also nothing, really nothing new, and uh, you know that, that's a normal doubt. So now that, let me check one second. Yes, one twenty one. I would like to pass to this bas relief that is pretty fascinating and that has sparked so much attention right so what what's the matter with this so as we were saying at the beginning we don't have great evidence of of um equipment that was motivated by the Western mercenaries into Seljuk armies. And uh, this is... So, it's very interesting. This is a carved relief from Konya. So we are in the heart of the uh, Sultanate of Rome. Um, this is dated to, um, I don't really know, I found, I believe, 12th as well as 13th century. Um, but, you know, we are right, you know, right around there. It's not that equipment or technology or armor changed radically at this point. So, yeah, you're right around that period. And this is actually very, very cool to watch, but as you understand, it's fairly crudely executed you know in terms of carving and all and uh, and it's fairly difficult to interpret this stuff by the way is uh, it's, uh, this time I believe um, this day the Museum of Turkish art in Istanbul Turkey um, so yeah in and, and, and uh, it would go yeah the, the the Turks arrived to Constantinople sorry to spoil you <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that's how it would happen. However, um, it's um, thi this bas relief is particularly important because um, s s scholars have identified into it pretty pretty elements that resemble the contemporary 13th century Byzantine and sometimes Iranian or Mesopotamian art. So, first of all, looking Let's look at from top to bottom. We have the helmets have small nozzles, right? And probably they were part of the wool. Uh, they were casted with the, with the wool bowls, right? 
so, and it also looks that they're wearing aventails, because if you look at their kind of neck you and in, in, in shoulder line, let's say you, you find that there is a sort of um, difference, there is a a level in in the middle, so that is probably interpretable as aventail. Now, naturally, aventail. Now we will see that the main problem with this kind of armor it was we don't really know what because it, it appears to be lamellar, right? Um, but we're not quite sure for the ways it's it's at least it's represented in here because it's obviously you would say well why that's lamellar, right? And I'm fairly positive that it can actually be because some have interpreted. It that um, you know, at least for the art artists, it seems that here the the aventails, this neck guard, are not part that are seemingly attached to, to internally to to the helmet, are not part of the torso armor, right? Of the rest of the armor, and they may be in fact similar to those pendant lamellar form that you see um, both in Byzantine and in Balkanic art, right? At this time. So obviously the ways of making armor wasn't that, you know, radically different from region to region. We're pretty much homogeneous, but s still we can maybe identify as similarities. Um, and you would say that, uh, in fact, looking at this, the, the body armor, uh, you, you have this kind of short sleeve. Armor and an armor arriving until the waist, really not not going down. Apparently, there are some tunics worn uh, under them, some, and which is normal, by the way. But it kind of stops to 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 the waist. That that uh, that's also fairly. I mean, it's not so in, unusual actually. There there are there's other armor that is composed really like that. By the way, sometimes. Armor was even worn, as you know, uh, at this time, the, the heaviest form uh, of armor entailed um, kind of mail, but with gambeson underneath, actually, or sometimes even overneath. But the torso protected with uh, kind of a lamellar or um, lamellar armor, and or scale armor, right? Where when those videos about the Nikaforian cataphracts I made is shows exactly that, and that's the ultra elite, by the way. Um, these guys do not seem, for the rest, particularly armored, especially under their waist, right? Which is strange because even male, as the li relatively lighter metal uh, form of of armor was uh, was usually going down. Here. I don't really know, by the way, some, I've read somewhere that the lamellar or, or scale armor sometimes weighs even lighter than male, but I think it really depends, I'm not really sure about this, by the way. Um, anyhow, the, the form is strange, and what is more strange, actually, is that, the, the, at least in the way it's rendered, or uh, pictorially, let's, well, not really pictorially, but in this form, uh, is that doesn't seem to be any... Um, segment, uh, let's say, the separation between the sleeves and the torso. So that's pretty strange, because usually lamellar armor is just the, you can wear it both on the torso and on the sleeves, but they're kind of two separated structures, right? Uh, they're often attached, there is, there are kind of either straps or, the, there is, however, a clear evident separation. Uh, in here, obviously, the guy, is, the, the author is showing us armor proper. Sometimes this armor would have, uh, as we were saying before, some garnets o overneath, like a gambeson or a surcoat or something like that. Instead you don't find it. Some, so some authors have assumed, for lack of these separations, that this could be an artistical ran, uh, rendition of actually male and not scale armor. Uh, because in that case, you can uh, re really in there the all the tissue of rings. Let, let's put it in this way: is continuous, and therefore you have this continuous solution. Even w w it's as if you had a shirt; it's only one piece, and you have the sleeves and the torso. The sleeves attached to the torso without apparent discontinuity, right? And just with different uh, at the side, you you can't. The, they're continuous, structurally speaking. Um, so, um, 
and, and it's interesting because in in contemporary times, uh, Byzantine armor was uh, being increasingly more characterized by male shirts or hauberks, as were they were called. So that was part of the East, uh, of the Western influence in um, Byzantine uh, armor uh, and stuff like that. So um, it's uh, it could be uh, the, the naturally we know that male was used also in um, in uh, you know in Islamic armies at this point in Near East Middle East. Um, and by the way, there are some finds from Cappadocia, so at the center of the Anatolian Plateau, from this very time that, um, especially in those subterranean churches, you know, that were built, um, are very, very, uh, uh, you know, fascinating under this uh, kind of tunnels in this area that has particular ground that allows that, that are um, a certain armor that is male as well. So there's been this interpretation th that against any apparent uh, uh, understanding would make this male, no, this this armor actually not being made of male but of, uh, oh, excuse me, not made of, of scale armor, uh, of scales, sorry, but of male, right? So this is an option, but I in my opinion it looks quite <laughs> like you know, uh, lamellar or, uh, or or scale armor at least. Even, especially you know, the figure on the right seems to have just this very, um, you know, uniform line. The way the way th the armor is rendered it seems that this uh, it's very flat, like a like a figure. Like the armor seems just these lines that are pretty li pretty even kind of irregularly put in there. Uh, the, if you look at the figure on the right, instead it, it looks very much like a real scale armor. It, it seemingly has even that, uh, apparently that uh, upwards orientation. If you look at uh, of, of the sc of the scales, um, if you look at the, it, it looks as if the the bottom of the scale, looking from up to down, is is narrower. Um, and that the the base uh, is larger. That that is to seem to give even this uh, depth effect for which uh, the at that point the the scale that is under is is really over the other one, in, uh, overlapping in part over the other one. It's you know that underneath they're sewn are usually over a either leather or other organic material, hence flexible um, skeleton, right? Uh, so, yeah, who knows? Even if you look at, for example, the nape of the warrior, you see here that they're not the the little the little scales that you find even under the neck. It seems that there is something longer, and that could look a bit like part of a not really of a metal armor, but like something like gambeson um, uh, or something like that. But it's not entirely clear really how the structure is. Uh, is meant to to be uh, working in here. Um, nevertheless, it's an astonishingly beautiful uh, evidence of what is definitely an armored um, couple of warriors. So, if you look at these fighters, you you see that they carry also this very interesting uh, short and round and hand uh, held shield. And um, they um, they have also this kind of short skirts and ankle length shoes of infantrymen. These do not have uh, spurs. They they don't seem to be cavalrymen. Sometimes you 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 find this bas relief as uh, defined as uh, these are kind of uh, cavalrymen. Well, of course, the, the kind of armor could definitely fit even for for a cavalryman. But these are meant to represent seemingly infantrymen, really. And um, and you know that even in Turkish art there was a lot of uh, emphasis both on mount troops um, and um, the, the uh, you know, the, 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 the symbol of the horse was quite important for, for the Turks, something that they brought from the steppe, even as a former kind of divine-like uh, creature. And uh, was it 
part of the same uh, military adders that existed in 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 West, in, you know, in, in Europe and for for chivalry. So they were extremely similar. F after all, because our chivalry comes from the same steps, and there is nothing to be surprised of. So this could lead to, to think that maybe these were troops uh, with a longer sedentary past in terms of uh, community of origins, maybe, uh, or that 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 resemble the the pretty strong. Uh, Byzantine infantry that still had quite an importance at this time. Most of Turkish uh, armies were based on on cavalry rather than infantry, right? And the Turks, especially now, we, we're here. It's about the 13th century, 12th century, but the Turkish armies maintained a, an astonishingly high uh, ratio of mounted troops, right? The normally Turkish armies were, you know, made up by by this bulk of heavy cavalry and then lots, lots of of lighter uh, horse archers. Uh, this seems to depict something related to uh, infantry. By the way, this small shield is also particularly interesting, um, especially combined with the weapons, because here you have uh, short, straight, non-tapering swords that seem actually Arab in form. I mean, there are many Arab swords that look very similar to this. You see that the one on the left is um, is apparently um, well, not necessarily longer, but it gives you the idea of the you know, kind of more um, spata-like form, right? It, the, you know, with, with a bare center that is shifted uh, yeah, towards the head, but not excessively. The other one looks like more um, like a curved blade, and something like uh, you know those kind of sabers, or at least cavalry, um, or short daggers, if you want, that are so common. However, has secondary weaponry here. So it's interesting because this kind of weaponry, especially small shield and tails, apparently a pretty dynamic and. Um, and also, uh, very uh, a pretty dynamic fighting style that that especially combined with the fact that legs seem to be unarmored could have to do with really um, really infantrymen here. You know that on on horseback, you know, having your legs protected in in some forms can be very useful. Here, uh, leg armor doesn't exist, and there is not even you know thigh protection here. As we were saying, the armor stops to the waist. So this could be really um, like two uh, foot soldiers of some sort. It could even be two champions fighting around. We don't really know. Um, but their equipment seems to be uh, modulated, at least chiefly for foot combat. I always given that, especially in this context, in Anatolia, that there is, it doesn't make much sense to distinguish excessively horsemen from infantrymen because these troops, uh, especially with such a high degree, uh, high level of, it's very heavy equipment, fairly heavy equipment, uh, heavy equipment, or at least very expensive equipment. Is, look at the armor; that that's big thing. Um, would entail that they were probably not the average trooper. The average, the average infantrymen. These are definitely heavy troops. Um, so there are people who, who tend to have higher skills or higher training to coming from from uh, from an entourage that that is more about war than the average levy peasant, right? So that's uh, those are troops that can he, uh, have quite easily and almost surely actually. Uh, very high uh, training, even in cavalry combat. Given, especially that context of frontier that we were talking about. Um, so, many uh, scholars, or at least some scholars, has suggested that this uh, equipment overall uh, could give the impression, um, given also some 
documentary sources that this troops are kind of more western like chiefly i i believe because they have this kind of more infantry oriented um fashion right which which at this point doesn't actually mean that it's necessarily a um frankish uh influence but simply it, it's part of the process of, of sedentarization of the turks in anatolia into lands that were sedentary since millennia and that um you know like every nomad for for every nomadic society that that settles in their land uh, you know are are going to take over as as a certain model of 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 fighting style obviously this is this doesn't mean that the the turkish armies uh lost their cavalry character even in anatolia um but let's say that uh that will stop actually only with the ottomans that will make always kind of very extensive use of these lighter cavalry still but they will try to develop even a kind of a you know more solid infantry that was what turkish armies usually lacked by tradition so yeah th- that's as far i believe as 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 we can go because there are not many other hints that can tell us okay this is kind of wet surely western influence the equipment could be easily come from from the east as well but it's the general uh um let's say mm, combination of of of, of equipment of, an ar- of arms and armors and more broadly this infantry co- this foot context let's say that makes us say okay this may be more the turks changing their mind into something more sanitary and that's definitely the, what they took from loc from the local damage right and the heavier equipment not because actually i don't think there was a great deal of difference in terms of of level of, of uh, armor of protection of armament between turks and byzantines uh you can't uh, or, or even westerners t- tendentially we say okay well the westerners were kind of more heavily armored stereotypically that is true but that's been too much emphasized it's, it's been already emphasized definitely i mean the, the even the islamic armies had heavily armored um cavalry uh, infantry as well because even this idea that uh it it was all about cavalry is is ideal it's obvious that infantry is is always there at all times so it's obvious that these troops if they had to fight on foot would simply have so this doesn't really tell you about that but it can be a hint right and um that that's pretty much all we have and then uh i don't know what else to add uh, i would just like to mention the 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 um, the martolos that is basically part of the remnant of the militia of the Byzantine Empire that the Ottomans eventually would gain control over around uh, 1430s um and they would maintain its name up to the 19th century and this term martolos seem, seemingly comes from the Greek armatolos so the the army the mili- uh, men or militiamen that were uh seemingly uh, you know important garrison troops uh in the in Ottoman history also on the frontier uh, initially they were christians because they were coming from byzantine communities but eventually they prog- progressively um, converted to islam as well but that's that's an example for example of this kind of byzantine militias existing obviously still in the um christian held territories um the, the territories held by the empire the turks uh, arri- uh turks arrive eventually to to conquer to integrate in their mil- military right now in the term martelos sometimes you you know various wildly because sometimes they were maybe just local peasantry that had police duties that were just exempted from tax uh from certain taxes or that they paid less products products at markets and stuff like that uh, in exchange so th- this term is very vague as you know it simply means militiamen and armed men as we've seen but these troops would be 
usually infantry. So even this is a carrier could tell us, you know, that um, maybe the, the relief that we saw before was something maybe closer to um, that type of uh, extraction than the original Turkish one, right? And um, in other ways you can find, for example, I've put, I think, at, at the end here some... Uh, this is a Turkish, uh, uh, another Seljuk bas relief that shows um, actually some lamellar or, uh, scale armor. Uh, this scale seems to be at, at least, you know, not oval shaped but square shaped, in which you see more clearly, for example, that separation between the sleeve and the torso. So that in the Konya bas relief that was not particularly evident but it could as well be that and you see in here that instead we're t we we are uh, it's basically that would be conceptually the same armor and you um and you can see that these are horsemen quite clearly in the most traditional turkish way the nomadic one on horsemen right and and, and therefore that they don't look excessively similar at the end of the day. Uh, so that is just to reflect and to say we know that few, really. But as far as we know, we know that, uh, you know, by the 13th century, the Western broadly meant influence was, was massive in the Sultanate of Rome. Um, so this can really be helpful to, really to mostly to widen your horizons, because that's at the end of the day what this studies serve to, is to show you how uh, w what's the hybrid, really, in war, in politics, in society, and how does uh, strict differentiation between you know Muslims from one side, Christians, you know, Crusades, wars of religions, Crusades are by definition no war of religion. Uh, they're not confessional clashes. They're not people trying to forcibly convert others. In Crusade, Crusade is just letting pilgrims go into one place and that passes through the defeat of Eton's armies but it's still widely and massively cooperating with them when there is the need for like in the case of this tense uh, you know this this hundreds and, and, and thousands of, of Christian troops that you find in, in the service of Muslim armies and 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 it was all the other way as well so yeah, that that's. I know I've been kind of incisive <laughs> in in this uh, videos, but it, it's important to get things straight because if we, I know that I, I push from the other side tendentially, but I I don't do it m maintaining the balance. Uh, with, I mean, eliminating the balance. Here is just that I've heard countless times this history told just in terms of oh, that guy you know, uh, that religion attacked the other. Whether it's the Islamic conquest, whether it's the Crusades, that's not really how the mechanism worked at the local, I mean, when, when things had to be carried out effectively. Because ideally, you know, all this idea of the religious effort, it's obviously there. If you look at the sources of the time, Christians were writing, we do it for our for our, uh, for God, Muslims thinking the same and everything was based on that because exactly because everything was based on that you realize that there was no difference and that the difference stood in other things that were happening and meanwhile so that um, for you uh, especially if you have no great uh, you know, introduction to those historiographies and all you say oh well that that's because that's really what they thought that's what that's because that's a stillism it doesn't mean that the religion was not important at all. R religion was of radical importance, but how things happened, that's the point. That uh, religion has a minority element. There is not one that has a majority one. And you could say profit, interest, it, it, it's actually a sum of things. But to narrow it down just to that, it's like saying, well, okay, I'm, I just have to stress this because I want to stress this. When you look at the evidence and you say, well, but maybe it didn't happen, then you have to 
to be more honest with yourself. And it's very sad that most people are interested in, in, in medieval history exactly for this, um, I would say, cultural clashes, generally speaking, that we're confronted with today, not in a, not in a very, uh, you know, the similar way it was, was done sometimes in the past, uh, in, in, even in these contexts, but... Um, you know, without concentra concentrating on an ideological stand that is just the, the open refusal to have an objective understanding of how things work. And it's shocking how, um, how people get, uh, you know, uh, I don't know even how to, to, to say this, this is a uh, 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 you know, scandalized by uh, by knowing that this is how it really was. I mean, uh, for example, this thing of the mercenaries in Frankish mercenaries in in Muslim armies, in Muslim armies is something you you know. I I knew, for example, if it happened, but I didn't know the specific uh, specifics. Now I I looked at something for making this video now, um, but that is generally something not really discussed. We talk about the history of the Crusades. It's all often about ah, the battles between that Crusader state and that uh, Muslim state. And and this stuff, in my opinion, is way more fascinating because it really goes be far beyond that, far beyond that you know kind of team concentration, like the uh, you know that that's all the only perspective that matters. And obviously, pick inside because if you don't pick side, you know it's it's kind of an insult, right? Uh, vote who looks at history without picking side because you know that's the most intelligent thing you can do, right? You know that's the best way not to understand a goddamn anything about history, if, if to be honest. But whatever. Today I'm kind of crazy and polemical, but uh, um, I will turn it down <laughs> um, soon. Um, just I I like this video. At least I like it's one of the few videos that I like myself um, from me uh, I hope that it's the same for you that you enjoyed this video and if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time